His Excellency Jevid Miljusinovic, Ambassador of Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia to the United States, spoke before the Council on November 26, 1991 at the Omni Inner Harbor Hotel. The speaker's address is entitled, Crisis in Yugoslavia. Introducing the speaker is Mrs. Sheila K. Riggs, President of Diversified Health Services Incorporated and Co-Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. This evening we have as our guest His Excellency Jevid Muyaz, I want to pronounce this right, Muyasinovic, Ambassador of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia to the United States. His topic is Crisis in Yugoslavia. And I think that we have all followed news of the civil war between the Serbian and Croatian peoples with great sadness, as well as with a sense that there are many unanswered questions um, from the standpoint of Americans about ethnic loyalties in Eastern Europe in general. Ambassador Mujusinovic uh, graduated from the School for Foreign Trade of the University of Belgrade. He joined the diplomatic service in 1969 and served in the embassy in New Delhi between 1969 and 1973. Following that, he spent three years as director of the Office for South and Southeast Asia, and then from 1976 to 1980 as deputy permanent representative to the United Nations. From 1980 to 1984, he was director of the Office for Non-Aligned Countries and served after that as director of the Bureau for Multilateral Affairs. He was ambassador to Iraq from 1984 to 1987 and assistant secretary for foreign affairs in charge of Asia, Africa, and Latin America in, um, in 1988. Since 1988, he has been a member of the government of Yugoslavia and was posted as its ambassador to our country in 1989. Will you join me in welcoming Ambassador and Mrs. Mujuzinovic to the council this evening? Mr. Ambassador. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your nice introduction. Uh, I have to, first of all, to mention a very dear friend of mine who is a citizen of Baltimore, Mr. Mrs. Helen Bentley Delich. She was supposed to be this evening with us, but she is busy in the Congress watching on the final uh, developments in the, in the Congress before the uh, holidays. Uh, she has been helpful, very much helpful, in promoting a balanced documents in uh, the in the Congress on Yugoslavia in uh, this uh, turbulent uh, two years of my assignment in Washington. I want to thank her profoundly, and I'm very happy that I can speak in the constituency she represents, in the, so ably represents in the Congress uh, this evening. The crisis in Yugoslavia has often been projected in the United States public and media as an irreconcilable clash between Catholic Slovenia and Croatia, influenced by the West European civilization on one side and the Christian Orthodox Eastern part that developed under Byzantine and Ottoman tradition and civilization, comprising the rest of the country on the other side. At one time, the crisis was persistently portrayed as a conflict between Slovenia's and Croatia's democratic regimes and the so-called last communist stronghold in Serbia and Montenegro. Meanwhile, as the crisis grew deeper and as it evolved into a civil war that brought along the horrors of killing and destruction, it has become increasingly, increasingly clear that the conflict is about and what, it is, uh, what the parties in the conflict are. It has become clear now that the clash is motivated by a disagreement of the interpretation of and application of principles of sovereignty, self-determination, territorial integrity, and the rights of national and ethnic minorities. Let me now comment each of these agreements shortly. 
Firstly, there is a disagreement over who is sovereign, a nation or a republic. One party claims that the republics are sovereign states as a result of a freely expressed will of their people. This, confirmed, this was confirmed by a number of referendums and by decisions of independence adopted by Slovenia, Croatia and Macedonia. For the other party, Serbia in particular, a nation can claim sovereignty irrespective of the actual republican borders demanding that the will of Serbian people living in other republics and expressed through referendum and plebiscite be honored. Some other interpretations of sovereignty exist, but these two are the dominant ones and they pose the basis of the current conflict between Serbs and Croats, between Serbia and Croatia. This is relevant in particular for the Serbs living in Croatia and who reject to live in an independent Croatia outside Yugoslavia. The Serbs in Croatia are afraid of genocide reminiscent of the one committed against them during the World War II. The Croats on the other side claim that there is no danger for them if they uh, display loyalty as citizens of Croatia. But the mistrust is so deep that it has evolved into a crisis, into a war with horrible shameful atrocities and destructions beyond the reason. Secondly, the dispute over the right to self-determination stems from those two opposing concepts of sovereignty. One side considers that the self-determination should be realized by peoples within the existing republics, and the majority should decide on the destiny and status of the republic and of the fate of its people in the future arrangements and shaping of the present Yugoslav space, irrespective of what nation makes this majority. The other side, however, insists on the right of self-determination of each people within their republics, including the right to secede from them. Again, it is a dispute between Serbs and Croats about the position of Serbs in, in Croatia. While the Croatian side claims that the self-determination of the majority of the population, means the Croatian population should determine the fate of all inhabitants of Croatia. Serbs do not agree to that, and they claim that the minority, the Serbs living in Croatia, have the same right to self-determination, including the right to secede. Thirdly, the territorial integrity of a republic is seen by one side as an inviolability of internal municipal frontiers, while the other side argues that those borders are merely administrative and arbitrary and therefore susceptible to change, provided that this is not done by force. Again, it is a question of frontiers between Serbia and uh, Croatia, but it not only between Serbia and Croatia, it might imply also frontiers between uh, Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Fourth, guarantees to the rights of national minorities and the dispute over who the national minorities are. For one side, the peoples of Yugoslavia, namely Serbs, Croats, Muslims, Macedonians, Slovenes, and Montenegrins, cannot represent national minorities in any of the Yugoslav republics. They, according to this opinion, must enjoy equal rights irrespective of where they live, because each of them has their own state within Yugoslavia. The peoples they see as national minorities are Albanians, Hungarians, Italians, Turks, Romanians, Bulgarians, and others. And they must be guaranteed, according to that opinion, their basic rights envisaged by the instruments of the international law dealing with the status of national minorities in a state which is not their mother country. The other side, however, considers that the Yugoslav peoples, too, if they live outside their republic, republics, must be treated as national minorities with the appropriate minority rights. At issue here is the conflict between the two concepts precisely as they affect the status of Serbs living in Croatia, which is the main cause of the ongoing brutal civil war in that Yugoslav Republic. By the same token, 
the Albanians in Yugoslavia do not see themselves as being a national minority, but as one of the Yugoslav peoples entitled to its own state, and therefore they, they demand to have their own republic on the part of the Serbian land, Kosovo. This is one of the controversial issues and the major source of instability in the Republic of Serbia. Fifth, the political crisis and the war in Yugoslavia have brought about an economic crisis of the magnitude unseen in the recent history of the country. Except for agriculture, which has recorded a substantial growth, all other economic indicators are negative. The economic reform sponsored by the federal government and supported by the outside world as a successful model of reforming a socialist economy and of their transition to the market economy and free enterprise has been completely relegated to the back burner, although the orientation itself was not abandoned. On the contrary, even in these harsh conditions of war, examples of free enterprise are many, and there are abundant evidence of successful ventures involving transformation of state-owned enterprises into different forms of privately owned companies, including the foreign ownership. The question now <clears throat> that is now asked is how long the war and the conflicts will go on, and is there any sign of the final settlement of the crisis which will enable the resumption of economic and other forms of cooperation between the United States and Yugoslavia, and of course between the rest of the world and Yugoslavia. All parties in the crisis must provide their answers. In that, se in that sense, our eyes are set on the Conference on Yugoslavia at The Hague, under the auspices of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe and the European Communities, which enter its critical stage. The conference in itself is the source of hope that the peace can be attained, but it will succeed to the degree to which the principal parties in the Yugoslav crisis wish so, and their willingness to compromise and accept realistic agreements under the given circumstances. The other focus of attention is current effort undertaken by the Security Council United Nations Secretary General and his able representative Secretary of State Cyrus Vance. They are on the verge of deciding to send United Nations peacekeeping forces to Yugoslavia if the ceasefire should hold. Both in Washington and in Yugoslavia, opinions are divided on whether the United States government has contributed enough to the search for the solution to the Yugoslav crisis. Some feel that it is not enough for the United States to merely hold consultations with the European communities and support their actions initiatives, and initiatives. For the others, others, this is precisely what the United States of America should do, since it is primarily a Euro European crisis. In my opinion, this is the most dangerous hotbed of crisis in the world today. Nowhere in the world are so many people being killed nor is there such heavy concentration of weapons in the hands of private citizens as there is in Yugoslavia. The war has threatened the survival of the entire regions in Croatia and is well on its way to spreading over to Bosnia and Herzegovina and possibly Serbia. This is a dangerous trend and if the war spreads to these two republics, it will be difficult to bring it under control and prevent the flare-up of the entire Balkan Peninsula. I think, therefore, that energetic and decisive action is needed to renew efforts at the conference in The Hague and in the Security Council of the United Nations, urging them to acknowledge and take into consideration reasonable proposals of all parties and go an extra mile in the peace efforts before the situation slips out of control. In that context, the joint statement by the United States the Soviet Union and the European communities represent an encouragement and gives us hope in an intensified joint efforts on the part of those three factors in the search for the way out of the crisis. In such conditions, the development of bilateral economic cooperation between the United States and Yugoslavia 
had to face considerable difficulties. The results have shown that the level of trade has managed to maintain was, uh, has managed to, to be maintained at the stable level despite the political and economic crisis in Yugoslavia and the stagnation of the U.S. economy, and that other aspects of cooperation have been not substantially affected. This is mainly due to the businessmen of the two countries and their efforts. Even in these difficult times, they have managed to find their interests and to seek ways of mutual linking and cooperation. I want to encourage them to continue in that direction because the crisis must end sooner or later, making it imperative for the business ties to be preserved as well as the other relations within the industrial and business community and their companies. We are now faced with the imposition of economic sanctions against Yugoslavia as an instrument designed to pressure politicians into negotiated settlement. Personally, I am against sanctions, and my activities in Washington reflect that conviction. However, the prevailing opinion of all the participants in the Hague Conference is that the sanctions are the ultimate means of pressure aimed at halting war and introducing a new political order in what now is Yugoslavia. But I hope that the sanctions will not last for a long period of time, and the situation will give incentive to those who impose sanctions to lift them soon. Certainly, I hope that the Security Council would not impose an oil embargo against Yugoslavia, since that would create additional suffering and hardship for the people and make it difficult for farmers to harvest autumn crops and to, to, to sow new ones. Moreover, the 14th ceasefire is holding with pretty good chances to be converted into a lasting armistice and peace supervised by the United Nations peacekeeping forces. You may wonder and ask, uh, what is the perspective of Yugoslavia? Is it going to continue as one state, or is it facing prospects of disintegration into several states? Uh, we had a year ago a good chance of staying as a confederation or as an association of sovereign republics. Such concepts have been advanced by Slovenia and Croatia, advocating a confederation, and the republics of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Macedonia, advocating an association of sovereign states. But Serbia and Montenegro rejected them and advocated a democratic federation. Today, Slovenia advocates full independence and does not want to speak about confederation. Croatia has taken similar attitude but is ready to cooperate in a common market with other republics. Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina are still advocating an association of sovereign states. At the Hague Conference, Lord Carrington has offered a concept of a loose association of sovereign states, which is not acceptable to, for Serbia. There have been new contacts between Lord Carrington and leaders of different republics aimed at narrowing the gap we now expect the conference to resume its work, and the results will be known soon. Personally, I think that we might end up with Slovenia as an independent state, Croatia as well, but linked to Yugoslavia through United Nations arrangements because of the position of the Serbian people in Croatia. Macedonia as an independent state, but linked to the rest of Yugoslavia, and Serbia and Montenegro comprising a federal state with Bosnia and Herzegovina closely connected with them, but with Croatia as well. We may end up with two levels of sovereignty, the level, uh, the level of the republics, for some of them, the level of federal sovereignty. I believe that some sort of Yugoslav association will continue as an international legal entity along with the international entity of the republics. Now we are discussing the uh, next stage of the uh, developments in Yugoslav war, civil war. The 14-6 uh, uh, ceasefire that has been brokered by Secretary Vance is holding with skirmishes and uh, violations here and there. 
The Security Council is considering the possibility of sending the UN peacekeeping forces, but is putting certain conditions. They are requesting the fairly stable ceasefire. They are requesting the commitment of the Yugoslav parties to resume political dialogue at the Haag conference in order to reassure the international community of the willingness of the main parties in conflict to seek and to find a political solution. And uh, they are also uh, looking into the modalities of where and how to place the United Nations peacekeeping forces in Yugoslavia. With regard to the first two conditions, I think uh, the agreement should not be difficult. The parties in the conflict are exhausted, economically, both Croatia and, and uh, Serbia, but other republics are on the verge of, con of collapse. And there are signs that uh, people have uh, uh, started losing their patience, and especially in the face of atrocities revealed after the fall of the city of Vukovar, the resistance to the continuation of war is in, uh, growing. The problem of placement of UN peacekeeping forces is an open question because Croatia insists that these forces should be put uh, at the frontier between Croatia and the neighboring republics, while the Serbs are insisting that these forces should be placed at the line that, has, that is dividing the Serbian population in Croatia and the rest of Croatia. This is going to be a difficult uh, problem, but I hope they will find some formula for it as well. So we are now approaching uh, the next stage uh, as a sort of a parcel, uh, which would comprise of three basic elements. One that the political solution should be sought within the pr program and uh, pr proposal suggested by Lord Carrington, aimed at converting Yugoslavia into some sort of a loose uh, federation or a loose association of sovereign republics. Two, uh, to uh, ensure the stability, uh, stable ceasefire, and three, to cooperate closely with the Security Council and the EEC in the uh, uh, placement, organizing and placement of the uh, United Nations peacekeeping forces, which is of course a very complex undertaking in view of the situation that there, you, there is no clear cut line between the uh, two hostile sides. It is uh, the line that is uh, going zigzag and therefore it is not so easy to determine exactly where these forces should be, should be placed. Uh, I personally hope that uh, this uh, is going to be supported by all main factors in the crisis, by the Serbs, by the Croats, and the, by, by the Yugoslav army, which has become also involved in this, in this war in its own way. Uh, I hope that the uh, United States government will support these uh, efforts in the Security Council, we have been assured by the high officials of the Ministry of State Department that the United States will cooperate with, continue to cooperate with the EEC in uh, implementing this uh, package deal, I would say, and in uh, launching the uh, peacekeeping forces with the intensified efforts to find a political solution. I have been told to speak about 25, 30 minutes. I have spoken 27 minutes. With this, I will stop at this, this stage, and I am at your disposal to answer your questions. We thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for that very concise and comprehensive overview of an extraordinarily complex situation. The floor is now open for questions. Yeah, there are. Father Hay, get the microphone. Might I ask, Mr. Ambassador, who commands the Yugoslav army now? The 
uh, Yugoslav army uh, tried to play a role of a buffer in the civil war between the Croatian and the uh, Serbian population in Croatia and tried to be neutral to the extent possible. But uh, with the development of the war conflict, situation changed both in the field and in the army and in the position of the army. The experience of the army in Slovenia, you remember that uh, in Slovenia we had a short, thanks God, a short and without uh, many uh, uh, sacrifices war for the control of border posts and the customs posts in, in the frontiers uh, between Yugoslavia and, 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 uh, and the neighboring countries. Uh, in that war, uh, Slovenian officers and the soldiers overwhelmingly opted for Slovenia. They did not agree, as of course many in Yugoslavia did not agree with the military involvement in Slovenia. And <clears throat> as a result, you have the decision later on of uh, the presidency of Yugoslavia and the, on the, the proposal of the command of the Yugoslav army that army should withdraw completely from Slovenia. And they have withdrawn. They have left Slovenia. They left for mostly for Bosnia and Montenegro, partly to Serbia. And then we had this uh, unfortunate developments in Croatia. Uh, <clears throat> the civil war that started after 25th of uh, June, means after the uh, Croatians declared their independence, started with skirmishes, with threats <clears throat> from both sides. The <clears throat> extreme forces in the both uh, Croatian and Slovenian uh, population perpetrating uh, s incidents, including, of course, killing of innocent people, and it went from one incident to another uh, until the situation ran out of control. In this process, the Croatian officers and men, members of the Yugoslav army, overwhelmingly opted for Croatia. So that the Yugoslav army really was slowly being reduced to the army of the Serbs, Montenegriners and partly Bosnians. Macedonia in the meantime also decided not to send its conscript to the army. And they stopped sending their conscript to the, to the army. So you may say that the Yugoslav army, it is called Yugoslav army, but practically it is not anymore the Yugoslav army. It has a very complex uh, system of command it is nominally and officially under the command of the presidency of Yugoslavia, to answer your question specifically. But the presidency has become a rump presidency because the four members of the presidency from Slovenia, from Croatia, Bosnia and Macedonia stopped participating in the work of the presidency because they felt that they cannot decide on merits on uh, how the army should behave. And we have now the situation that practically at the federal level, we have the RAMP presidency, we have RAMP uh, parliament, and we have RAMP army, which is dominated by the uh, Serbian officers. But again, uh, it is, uh, question whether these are completely Serbian officers, because the Minister of Defense is half Croat, half Serb. His father is a Croat, his mother is a Serb, and he comes, he was born in Croatia, and he is half-half. His deputy is 
100% Slovenian, Admiral Brovet. And some other uh, undersecretary is Macedonian. I have the, uh, uh, some information that the Serbian leadership is not very uh, happy with the relationship between the army command and the Serbian leadership. Because they find, the Serbian leadership finds the army command to be uh, left over from the Bolshevik system of education and training, while the Serbian leadership is a more, I would say, nationalistic oriented rather than Marxist uh, motivated. So uh, the Ram presidency formally is in command of the army, but the uh, world has recognized that the uh, considerable authority is vested with the Minister of Defense and his deputy and his group members of the general staff. And that's why uh, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance, in uh, trying to promote the 14th ceasefire, invited to Geneva leaders of Croatia, Dr. Tuđman, uh, President of uh, Serbia, uh, Mr. Milosevic, and Defense Minister, Mr. Kadijevic. And they, three of them, really represent factors now in the conflict which uh, who can influence the further development. They are at the moment, all three of them are committed to ceasefire, but there are still some tactical uh, move, moves and counter moves. I don't want to enter into details, but I have tried to be the best of my ability to answer your question. Who is supplying the Serbs and the Croats with their armaments, with their guns and their tanks, and what kind of financial problems are they incurring? Are they able to pay for these things? Are they able to get these things from foreign countries? What's behind all of this? I hope they will uh, exhaust their uh, resources soon. <laughs> because uh, the war, of course, is very costly, both in human lives and in the, in the destruction and of course in acquisition of weaponry. The army that is uh, fighting on the side of Serbians is of course well supplied army. It has its own arsenals and its own production and they have a lot of arms. The Croatian uh, armed forces have acquired arms from abroad or they have snatched it from the Yugoslav army by overrunning garnisons and barracks. They have uh, captured about 200 tanks of the, from the Yugoslav army and uh, other heavy armory by uh, occupying, by taking over certain garnisons and certain outposts of the Yugoslav, Yugoslav army. But there is, of course, smuggling going on. You know that the, whenever the war breaks out, there are so many margins of death who go around and offer you different arms and offer you certain facilities, credits, and so on. But as I said, I hope the, uh, there is an embargo imposed by the Security Council on the arms delivered to Yugoslavia. But, you know, without an effective international control, it is hardly difficult, uh, possible to expect them to, to, to respect this, this embargo. Yes. Assuming peace can be brought to this part of the world again, what does the Republic of Serbia um, have in terms of natural resources? What are the ingredients of their economy that they could offer? And related to that question, sir, is, is not at the nucleus of this problem the dependency uh, the production abilities of a republic like Croatia? Uh, <clears throat> Croatia, to answer your uh, second question, Croatia is one of our more developed republics. We have uh, Slovenia and Croatia, and uh, Croatian uh, per capita income is, uh, let's say, 
three to four times higher than uh, in, uh, the per capita income in Kosovo or double the per capita income in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Macedonia. And the potentials of Croatia are industry. This is a traditional industrial uh, uh, republic, especially the shipbuilding. You know, Yugoslavia was the third largest producer of ships, maritime ships uh, in the world. And uh, uh, most of those ship, uh, shipyards have been operating in Croatia. Secondly, it has uh, the tourism industry. It has beautiful coast with 1,000 islands. Uh, third, it has uh, the, uh, agriculture, which is uh, very highly uh, developed and modern. It has ports, number of ports that serve as uh, transit for the European countries, which again bring a lot of uh, revenues. So the Republic is really a Republic with a lot of potentials and a lot of uh, uh, production capacities. But I don't think this was the reason of uh, conflict between the Serbs and Croats. Because Serbia, on the other hand, has also potentials which are, uh, <clears throat> in the, again, in the industry, in the agriculture, in the, in the services, uh, in the trade. And it is, of course, uh, one of our, again, more developed republics. Uh, if you divide these uh, three republics, you have Montenegro, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Macedonia is underdeveloped, and the three, Serbia, Croatia, and, and Slovenia, as developed republics. Uh, but uh, having said that, I don't think these uh, economic reasons are really behind the conflict. Behind the conflict is history, is uh, uh, Tradition is a mistrust that has been there for forever, so to say, and is, of course, uh, irresponsible behavior of uh, political leaders on both sides, who instead of trying to mitigate these differences, they are playing them up and making them uh, springboard of their uh, influence and their political prestige, which, of course, unfortunately has led to this uh, unfortunate war. Mr. Ambassador, after listening to you, the problems in the United States between the Republicans and the Democrats seem very minimal compared to what's going on in your country. My question, Mr. Ambassador, uh, deals with um, the human rights issues in Yugoslavia and the religious issues. What is going on in those fields in your country, Mr. Ambassador? <clears throat> the human rights, of course, is one of the uh, priorities of the Yugoslav society. As you know, we have had the multi-party elections two years ago in all the republics. And uh, in the elections, platforms of all and parties that have contested elections, the human rights was one of the topical issues. Uh, both from the point of view of uh, emphasizing the importance of applying the international standards in observing the human rights and in overcoming the past that was uh, characterized by uh, certain violations here and there, both of the individual and the collective rights of minorities. As far as the religious rights are concerned, Yugoslavia was uh, one of the socialist countries that uh, has uh, 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 tolerated the re religious freedom uh, and considered the religion as a private matter separated from the state. As a result, you can, when you travel across Yugoslavia, see scores, hundreds of new churches, new mosques built in the socialist Yugoslavia. Uh, of course, you cannot say that uh, religion uh, was 
uh, at the level of freedom, it would be necessary to qualify the society as completely religiously toler tolerant. Because uh, we, have one, we had a one-party uh, system in Yugoslavia. The party was an atheist party. And uh, the religious people were considered somehow uh, people who have their own uh, perception of the society, which is not always in, uh, uh, in accordance with the perceptions of the ruling party at that time. But still, we can say that the religious freedoms in Yugoslavia have existed throughout the post-war period during the Marshal Tito's time, and that uh, there are no major complaints of the religious communities in Yugoslavia today about their past uh, in the, during, the, during the Tito time. But definitely with the democratization of society, the prospects of religion becoming more uh, uh, acceptable to the broader, broader uh, public, uh, that is a new reality. And uh, we have now uh, experienced that in uh, all the religious holidays are being observed as uh, non-working days, uh, that uh, the religion is being taught in the schools as a facultative subject for those pupils and kids uh, who want it, which was not possible in the past. So there is, there is a change to the better. You talked about the ultimate goal of being a loose confederation of states. Um, do you think that Serbia be, would be willing to return the, the land it has won from Croatia in return for this goal? And if not, how likely do you think it is that Croatia would be willing to join in a confederation of states with um, Serbia, which had just won um, a, lar a good portion of its land? I have, I have said that uh, there is a, a likely possibility that the proposal of uh, Lord Carrington uh, of a loose association of sovereign republics might be acceptable, not co confederation. Uh, might be. I'm not uh, really positive about this uh, because um, the Slovenians are definitely this, they have the, they decided to go their own way. So have the Croats. But the Croats have the limits because they have six to seven hundred thousand Serbs in Croatia. And the Serbs say, all right, if you want to be independent, you are free to be independent, but not the territories we occupy. The territories which we occupy and which, in which we live will stay in Yugoslavia. They will not be part of Serbia, but they will be autonomous uh, republics or autonomous regions uh, in, uh, in the future, future Yugoslavia, Ramp Yugoslavia again. And this is a limit for Croatia. I, at this stage, I cannot answer how this uh, question will be resolved. Hopefully, they will find some formula that the Serbs stay in, in Croatia, but with a special status, with some autonomy, with special rights. And uh, that, then that could be a link between Croatia and uh, the rest of Yugoslavia. I'm a Bosnian. and. Uh, uh, I simply cannot imagine the Republic of Croatia and Bosnia being separated completely. Because all the railways, all the highways, all the uh, ports, and all the communications and transport and the uh, link between the people, that, uh, that is so, so interlinked, intertwined, that uh, it's impossible to separate completely. But, uh, uh, the Croats, as people, have decided to go their own way. And nobody can stop them. That is their right, and uh, they will go, provided the circumstances allow. I don't know how this situation will be resolved, really. I cannot answer this question now. Yes, sir. My question is about Bosnia. Uh, what, what about the stability in Bosnia, and how they manage not to take part in this conflict? Well, this is a small wonder, I can, I can uh, say. But uh, the 
mutual tolerance of the three religions, of three people, Serbs, Croats, and Muslims, I'm Muslim, uh, is uh, historically, historically uh, founded and uh, even during the World War II, the atrocities committed in Bosnia were not so severe, so ferocious as they were in Croatia and in other parts of Yugoslavia. And they are, of course, asserting each and every of them loyalty to Croats to Croatia, Serbs to Serbia, but above all, they are still asserting uh, loyalty to Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, I hope that uh, that uh, mood will prevail. The Serbs have uh, this, uh, had a plebiscite recently in Bosnia and Herzegovina, according to which they have decided to stay in Yugoslavia, in federal Yugoslavia, which implies the possibility of cutting off part of Bosnia and joining Serbia and Montenegro in a federation. As a consequence, Croats have organized the municipalities with the majority population of Croatians, saying that they will organize themselves as an autonomous region, and they will decide on their future later on. There are speculations that the Serbian and Croatian leaders are discussing among themselves the possibility of dividing Bosnia between uh, Croats to going to Croatia, Serbs going to Serbia, and creating a mini Bosnia and Herzegovina of the Muslims. But uh, I hope that this will not happen, that the international community and the Bosnians themselves will not uh, uh, come to this stage of, uh, of, the, of division. The question is, is Yugoslavian nationalism dead, given the circumstances of the immediate past? <laughs> Under present circumstances, the spirit of uh, belonging to Yugoslavia and uh, Yugoslavianism as such has diminished. Still there are about uh, three million people in Yugoslavia who have declared themselves as Yugoslavs as a nationality. But they are scattered around and they are not concentrated in one of the or two republics so that uh, they cannot uh, represent the majority to decide one way or the other. Therefore, uh, in my opinion, the uh, spirit of uh, Yugoslavianism and the Yugoslavs is diminishing, and there are no chances at this stage to be revived in order to impose itself as a dominant feature of uh, the Yugoslav national political life. People are Serbs, Croats, Montenegrinians, Macedonians, Slovenes, Muslims, Albanians, hardly any of them, as I said, are Yugoslav. There are those who are in mixed marriages, and there are three million of them out of 24. It's not a small number, but as I said, they are all over. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> similar to his question in a way, but just with the deep-seated um, differences and feelings uh, that there are amongst the people such as the Serbs and the Croats, um, do, you f do, you f do you see any chance um, for reconciliation? Um, or do you see endless enmity between those groups? Also, I'm curious, um, given all the changes that are taking place in Europe, um, and in the international scene, what role would you as a Yugoslavian um, like to see the Balkans, what kind of relationship between the Balkans and the European community, and what role would you like to see the Balkans playing in the changes that take place? And finally, just really quickly, I'm curious because in Eastern Europe, so many of the countries have experienced such difficult ecological situations because of their industrialization. Does, has Yugoslavia had a similar problem with industrialization in relationship to its environment? To answer the last question, yes, we have ecology problems and uh, <clears throat> we are trying to cope with them. But now, of course, it's relegated to secondary question. 
and I've, now is the question of survival, life and death of the people. And the main preoccupation is, of course, the how to end the war. Secondly, Balkans and Europe. We have been uh, promoting the Balkan regional cooperation in the last few years at the initiative of Yugoslavia. And it was going very well. And we had a pretty good uh, chances of uh, becoming sort of a junior partner to the European community. But now with these developments in Yugoslavia, I, don't, I really cannot say how things will develop. But uh, uh, irrespective of how things uh, come out, the interest of each and every republic is to join the EEC, ultimately. And this is one of the instruments of pressure in the hands of the EEC. And that's why, really, the international community has agreed to relegate the question of the Yugoslavia to the EEC, and not uh, to, to some other institutions because they have instruments of pressure. Whether there is a, a chance of reconciliation between Serbs and Croats, well, I don't think the reconciliation is possible in a very sh uh, short uh, period of time. It will require years of cooling off period because so many things have happened and so many people have been killed, innocent people from both sides, that uh, uh, it will take years uh, before a genuine reconciliation uh, is uh, achieved. It will take years, unfortunately. Yes, ma'am. I've heard it said that an underlying cause of this war is that Yugoslavia is not able to export as it would like to. Uh, that, for instance, the American market is not really open to Yugoslav products at a reasonable price. Could you comment on that? Uh, the, one of the causes of the instability in Yugoslavia before the war started was really economic situation. Over indebtedness of uh, Yugoslavia, you know, international debt was a very big burden on Yugoslavia. We had a net outflow, outflow of capital in the last four, four or five years instead of uh, attracting the foreign capital for development to Yugoslavia. And that, of course, has created a lot of nervousness in uh, various parts of Yugoslavia with some republics wishing to dis detach themselves from the rest of the country, especially the developed one like Slovenia, and to join the EEC as soon as possible. Uh, the limits to Yugoslav exports are really not in the United States. Limits are in ourselves. We are not uh, able to produce enough goods that the United States market is ready to accept. For instance, you know the Yugo car. There was a big uh, propaganda and all this and that, and, and it went off uh, nicely. But the factory could not really meet the demands of uh, the American market. Uh, it met the, the qualitative demands. You know, they improved the car, but they could not uh, produce enough uh, automobiles to meet the demand of the market, and that has been reduced now to, to very few cars and perhaps they are closing completely. So the limit is not in the restrictions in the, US, in the American market, but the limit is on our, in our, on our sole side. But sir, uh, Yugoslavia makes some, has some very fine wines and we don't find those available for purchase here in the United States. Well, that's, that is, that's something said, that could be exported. This is it? our fault. That is, uh, I said, this is... So uh, I understood it was the difficulty of entering the American market. We don't, uh, we don't have major problems with the American market, madam. We don't have. The American market is generous and open to Yugoslav products, provided we have quality, quantity, and stick to the terms of delivery. But... Uh, we have achieved considerable uh, turnover in trade. To, we have reached about $1.6 billion, which is quite a, quite a value. But uh, 
according to potentials of the, this market, uh, this is, this is, this is uh, very little. And uh, when the war is over, I hope that uh, this will be realized and that uh, the trade will grow faster and Yes, ma'am. Yes. As I understand it, there are several languages spoken within what we know of as Yugoslavia. I'm not even sure how many. How easy or difficult is it for people to communicate with each other? Do, do they know each other's languages? Are there bodies of literature in the various la national languages? Uh, the basic language in Yugoslavia is Serbo-Croat or Croato-Serb, spoken by, let's say, 80% of the population, spoken in Serbia, in Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and, and, and Montenegro, uh, as official language. There is Macedonian language, there is Slovenian language, these are also official languages, uh, but these are also Slavic languages, which are easily to be understood by those speaking Croatian or Serbian language. Uh, the difference is, of course, when we uh, speak about the language of Albanians, it's a completely different language, and Hungarians, it's a completely different language. But, you know, the problem of uh, linguistic communication has never been there. We have uh, had this uh, mutual tolerance of languages and uh, they have developed uh, in their own way in the federal institutions. We have, uh, uh, in the communication between ourselves, we have used three languages always. There was interpretation of the federal parliament. So there was no uh, linguistic problem. It is more mental, psychological, historical, cultural, these are the problems that uh, have been inherited from the past and that uh, have led to this situation that is now. Mr. Ambassador, we're deeply grateful to you for sharing the, the evening with us. The, um, you've uh, been extraordinarily informative. Um, your uh, schedule and uh, pressures at this particular time are, are uh, intense uh, and that you should take time from them. Uh, in order to uh, help educate us uh, is a very generous act indeed on your part. Thank you. Thank you very much.